are going to have our keynote now from Professor Jane McNaughton. Um, and we'll have a little bit of time for, for um, questions afterwards before we move on to our afternoon session. And so it gives me great pleasure to introduce you to Jane McNaughton. She is Durham University's Deputy Pro Vice Chancellor for Research and has special responsibility for research culture, amongst other things. She is a professor of medical humanities at Durham University in the anthropology department and previously has been director of the university's Institute for Medical Humanities, which she founded as a center over 20 years ago now. It achieved significant funding from the Wellcome Trust over the years. The center and later on the institute has paved the way for proving the interdisciplinary approach and how new researchers such as our ECRs here today could be educated in a new approach, a new way of changing the world. And indeed, the process of actually talking across our different perspectives or different experiences or different intellectual groundings is itself important. Now, Jane's fo research focuses on the idea of the symptom, its initial appearance, development and evolution in connection with medical contexts, habits and technologies. Jane has a varied background. She took a degree in English and history and then studied medicine and then took a PhD in philosophy in her spare time without having a background in philosophy. So I think that makes her a true polymath. And Jane recognised how much you can learn if you are open to other people's disciplinary groundings and by recognising what it was that she had to bring at, to the table as a clinician. She knew that you have to have somebody in the room who can see the larger picture and who can also see where the work might go and make a difference to health. In effect, Jane was providing leadership when there was really no template for that kind of leadership. Jane recognised the love and extra effort that's required when you're not when you're not supported by disciplinary infrastructures. And that's something that's really, really important, that love and extra effort that's required. It still holds true. And it's something that we celebrate today. No matter how early career our researchers here are, you should have a sense of how special you are. Jane's a lateral thinker. She's, she's generous with her time, her musings and her encouragement. She's eminently sensible, which is the highest praise I can give her, and is an asset to the field of medical humanities, which wouldn't be so healthy were it not for her, interdisciplinary research and Durham University. So, ladies and gentlemen, it is with humble thanks that I offer you a keynote speech from Professor Jane McNaughton. Golly, um, I'm trying to say follow that, actually. I think perhaps we could maybe go and have our tea now. Um, but thanks, Amanda, for that extremely generous um, and lovely introduction. And um, just interesting, you've passed over a few things that I think I hope to kind of cover in my, in my talk this afternoon. So, yeah, my remit was to talk about interdisciplinarity and its relationship with research culture. And I thought what I would do is... It's, I think it's quite important to be clear about what you're talking about. So I thought I'd say a little bit about what I think interdisciplinarity is, why it's actually important right now, and I think especially in our field of health-related research, how we, how we might go about it in drawing, as, as Amanda suggests on my experience in the Institute, and the kind of challenges that there are, I think particularly for, for people at early career researcher level. And then say a bit about its relationship to culture. And if I have time, I think just a little bit about, about career structures, which is something that I feel very passionate, passionately about, is important to kind of just open out for, for people. So first of all, what, what is interdisciplinarity? Well, there are various ways of thinking about it. Here are some, here are some um, definitions that I found. Interdisciplinarity, the process of answering a question, solving a problem, that's too broad or complex to be dealt with adequately by a single discipline or profession. That's a fairly straightforward one. Um, then we have this a mode of research by teams or individuals that integrates information, data, techniques, tools, perspectives, concepts, etc., for two or more disciplines in order to advance understanding or solve problems. That's getting closer, I think, to the kinds of things that we certainly do in the Institute. But this one, I think, is the one that I feel most um, 
aligned with the capacity to integrate knowledge and modes of thinking drawn from two or more disciplines to produce a cognitive advancement. For example, explaining a phenomenon, solving a problem, creating a product, or raising a new question. And that, that issue about raising a new question is something that I feel um, aligns, I think, with, with what, we, what we do in, in, in the Institute particularly, because one of the challenges, I think, in health-related research is the sort of drive to answer questions that are presented to you by the cool face of clinical practice. And as a, as a, as a medic myself, you know, there's plenty of questions arise there. And it presents you with a kind of question and you think, okay, here's a way of answering it. But sometimes if you stand back a bit further from that cool face and start to think, well, what are the important questions? That's where the interdisciplinary process comes in. And we've been very fortunate in the Institute, I think, um, because of the generous funding we've had from the Wellcome Trust, to have had the, the um, privilege of being able to stand back, to take time, to not necessarily uh, present the, the research questions at the outset of our, of, our, um, of our research. And of course, we've got this distinction between interdisciplinarity, multidisciplinarity, and transdisciplinarity. So we've got multidisciplinarity research insights for two or more disciplines without attempting to integrate them. Without that, just you've got two things kind of giving their different perspectives and that, that can be helpful. And transdisciplinary research suggests the involvement of non-academic partners. So I think that's, again, an interesting one that kind of connects with certainly our medical humanities view of what interdisciplinarity is about. And of course, a lot of this, uh, as, you, as you'll know about C.P. Snow's Two Cultures, um, uh, which set um, the arts, particularly the, the cultures of the arts and humanities against scientific cultures. And um, uh, this, uh, this is what C.P. Snow writes, that the clashing point of two subjects, two disciplines, two cultures of two galaxies, so far as that goes, ought to produce chances. In the history of mental activity that has been where some of the breakthroughs came, the chances are there now, but are there as it were in a vacuum because these two cultures can't talk to each other. And when C.P. Snow, uh, Snow wrote this back in the 50s, um, that was certainly the case. There hasn't hadn't been that ability to talk together. And actually at this stage when he was writing, it was the scientific cultures that were the kind of, uh, the, the poor relation. And people thought, you know, yes, being uh, in the arts and humanities was much the more, the kind of senior, the blue ribbon uh, field to be in, the people who were the real thinkers. But I think that's shifted, shifted and changed now. But this is, this is I mean, it was really interesting that C.P. Snow was writing this, just this sense of the opportunities, the chances that come through this kind of interdisciplinary engagement and conversation. So why is this important now? Well, oh, sorry, everybody. Um, I think um, this is really critical because um, previously, um, uh, previous approaches to uh, health-related research in the past, the big, the big challenge is a sort of single um, uh, uh, issue um, uh, uh, condition uh, um, approaches, um, conditions that were perhaps a little bit more straightforward and simple. Whereas nowadays in the 21st century, you know, we have an epidemic of uh, non-communicable diseases, um, uh, obesity, various sorts of chronic illness, such as COPD, heart disease, We've got multimorbidity. We've got the, the elderly people who've got, got a number of different conditions um, of uh, mobility, as well as, as diabetes, as well as heart disease, as well as lung disease. And we've got all these things interacting. And it's very, very difficult just to think about trying to solve this through a single disciplinary area, for example, like biomedicine. All of these things are determined through um, social problems, political problems, um, cultural, ethnic, families, all sorts of areas, as you'll all know, go to making up um, these kinds of conditions. And indeed, I think we could add COVID uh, being a, an interesting element of this now, um, because this is the kind of um, issues that I think we see now um, uh, determining uh, um, 
uh, condition health related problems in practice. You see there we're including social determinants, education, work and environment. All of these things, as is indicated by the diagram, contribute to people's susceptibility to, to COVID. And I, I'm really interested that I've just been over in um, Sweden in Linköping, and I'm working with um, colleagues there on a new project that's been that's been funded by the Swedish Research Council into long COVID, um, which we'll all know about. I mean, a really um, you know devastating but fascinating condition that has actually in many ways been, um, been sort of determined and defined through, through patient activism, through patients experience it and saying, this is what we're, this is what's happening. And we in this project have got the chance to sort of start to um, examine the evolution of this problem um, in real time and uh, taking into account all these different um, uh, influences upon it um, and trying to kind of, through a medical humanities approach, which takes all these things into account in a kind of critical way to determine a new condition as it emerges. And that's a very exciting uh, prospect. So this is my colleague, Felicity Callard, also writing about, about, about this, that this terrain, uh, minds, brains, and the environment encompassing many of the most pressing societal questions of our age. Um, and this was her talking about the sciences, the social sciences and the neurosciences relationships. But I think this really applies to so many of the, the healthcare problems that all of us, I think, around, the, around this conference today are thinking about. And we are, I think, encouraged in doing this by the funding um, environment that we've got now. So Wellcome Trust obviously is a very important uh, funder for this kind of work that really um, encourages uh, interdisciplinary work. Um, we've got um, the AHRC MRC Global Public Health uh, Challenges Research, which, was, uh, which came out a few years ago. And I think particularly, very interestingly, um, I don't know if you're aware of this um, report that was produced by the Academy of Medical Sciences called Improving the Health of the Public by 2040. It's a really fantastic read. And it, often within this document, which came out a few years back, they refer to the importance of the arts and humanities uh, integrating with social and health sciences um, to understand better how to address the health problems that we now face. And here again, it is an important element of what we need to do to try to improve the health of the public in the future is to develop transdisciplinary, they call it transdisciplinary because of this engagement issue, health capacity. And I think, I mean, to do, to do a tribute here, I think to, to um, uh, Amanda and the team here in, in the Wolfson, this is really what, what I think we're trying to do in Durham now, actually, is to think, okay, we have got the opportunity as researchers in health, not necessarily tied to the needs of delivering um, healthcare practitioners through a, through a medical school or a nursing school or whatever a kind of health practitioner school. We have the opportunity to stand back from that clinical cold face and think, well, okay, what are the real questions to be asked and how do we address them um, through our um, transdisciplinary um, approaches? So, um, oh yes, and this was another, um, uh, another uh, mention of the importance of the arts and humanities um, we want to do. Now, just thinking, I just wanted to let, you know, to introduce you to the, the characteristics of my own field which align, I think, with some of this thinking and are really quite important um, for the kind of work that we've been doing in, in IMH. Um, so characteristics of critical medical humanities. Now, this, this emergence of critical medical humanities came out um, mainly through an editorial that colleagues of mine wrote in the journal Medical Humanities about five years ago. Um, and the attempt here, I think, was to try to align um, a new development of medical humanities with a sense of, a, of critical disciplines, a, a sense of a, a critical viewpoint in the same way that area, um, fields like critical disability studies, critical feminist studies, all of these things we're, we're trying to bring in these critical fields to think about health uh, more clearly. And um, 
so we've got um, an important the importance of widening the sites and scales of the medical beyond this what 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 my colleague Angela Woods calls the primal scene of the clinical encounter. And I think you know in universities where the medical school is absolutely the kind of gravitational force of the work, um, it's quite difficult to get out of the needs of that clinical encounter. Whereas we in here in the Wolfson and here in the Institute for Medical Humanities, we can get out of that and think, well, where does where is health produced? Where does it evolve? Where does health and ill health uh, evolve and where is it produced? And how do we understand those contexts and how do we help address them? Um, and, and this is what this is saying. How, how, are, how is um, the experience of health and illness um, how, how are they constituted, how are they created and sustained at multiple levels? And um, as I was saying earlier, closer engagement with critical theory, queer and disability studies with activist politics. Very often I look around, um, and that may well be the case with many of you here in the room today, I look around my colleagues, my, my kind of new colleagues in the Institute, and very often what's emerging now are researchers who not only are fascinated by the intellectual inquiry, but actually are activists within the spaces that they're um, looking at. So we have got people working in um, the field of neurodisability, um, people working in um, the field of um, uh, medically unexplained symptoms, in the area of anxiety, all of whom have their own experiences to bring to bear and are very committed to trying to make positive change for people in these spaces. Now, these are important. Um, and. Uh, it's very important for us that um, uh, the humanities and social sciences are not seen in service to or in opposition to the clinical, but are productively entangled with a biomedical culture. So that sense of entanglement that we, in our interdisciplinary studies, we come together, we, we work together to try to generate those questions and um, find those solutions uh, together um, rather than in a kind of separate space and a robust commitment to new forms of interdisciplinary and cross-sector collaboration. So this is very much um, our view. So our, our approach to interdisciplinarity has really these, these features. We, we combine um, academic, academic disciplines with people who are working in clinical fields and clinical scientists, as well as what we call experts by experience. So that's those people who have a commitment to the field we're examining because they are themselves experiencers. So I've recently finished a project on breathlessness and we work very closely with people who experience that symptom from day to day. And my colleagues in Hearing the Voice project have um, done the same with people experiencing voice hearing. And it's important the interdisciplinary approach generates the questions, as I said earlier with one of my definitions, and doesn't just respond to preset ones. And it, as we involve those with an interest, um, it ensures, we hope, relevance to what really matters. Now there's challenges with that too, which I'll address a bit later on, or at least raise. And the interdisciplinary space is different from the disciplinary because there's this, this potential for innovation because of the mix, not only of methods of knowledge, but also of methodologies. So very often there is that requirement to be innovative, to, to create new methodological approaches in order to um, address the questions that we raise. So that's really critical. Um, so doing it, these are some pictures from some of us um, involved in the Hearing Voice project um, a couple of years back. Um, and this is a picture down here on the, the left-hand side of my colleague, Mary Robson, who's our creative facilitator. I'll say a bit more about that in a minute. But these are the features that I've, I've kind of come to the conclusion are really critical for the kind of interdisciplinary research which happens in teams. Now, there's, and we can discuss this, there's also a question of whether interdisciplinary work, interdisciplinary work is possible within the, the um, activities of a single researcher. And I think it probably is. I mean, Amanda was kind enough to give you a sense of, of the kind of range of different disciplines that I've studied and been involved in myself in my career. So. I'm, I'm thinking of making use of that as I reach the end of my career in, in um, doing some work on the menopause. So I think that is possible, but 
But I think the most exciting and innovative work happens within teams. So it, it requires planning and an and intention to, to ensure you hold the line in terms of interdisciplinary work, because it can drift away. It's hard work, it's not easy. You need a safe space away from the usual working spaces. And in some ways in Durham, we're fortunate to be a collegiate university. We're fortunate to have spaces, if we have them as institutes, where um, people can come away from their disciplinary um, places um, into a space that, that is not their usual one. And that actually enhances the ability to work with others. Time is critical. And as the, the DBP, I'm really wanting to look into how we release better quality time for people to do this kind of work. I think you need continuity of personnel because of that relationship with the bullet point, a couple of down, which is about good relationships. Developing good relationships in the doing of this work is critical. Disciplinary expertise is really important because um, we all need to be able to explain, to talk about our field. We talk about its knowledge, its ways of doing things, and we need to be able to explain that to others um, who may be entirely unfamiliar with it. Um, and it's really important that we have that expertise to do it. So good relationships, as I say, is critical. And I think in certainly in the work that we've been doing, it's very important to have a good facilitator. Now, this is not something that's given to all of us working in these fields, but we have the benefit of having uh, Mary uh, Robson, who's our um, uh, creative, what we call our creative facilitator, and she's worked on all of our big projects. And her job is to create, to create the interdisciplinary space. Um, and that means that um, certainly, for somebody like myself, who's maybe the PI on the project, I then become um, part of the team, not the leader. So Mary creates the space. She often uses different techniques to enable us from all these different sorts of spaces and disciplines and, and sorts of expertise and indeed hierarchies within the academic um, uh, um, area to come together to a, to a kind of flat um, plane to, to um, get away from our usual ways of, of thinking and working to, 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 um, to work in a creative way. And I'll explain that a bit better in a minute with, a, with an example. And I think humility is a very important value um, or attribute within working in this because you need to recognize what you don't know in order to listen hard to other people. I think medics could do with a good slap of that as well, actually. So um, just a, a, a a good example, I think, is our Hearing the Voice project, which you'll be able to see more about um, on the website, has recently come to an end and, and been extraordinarily successful and inspired a lot of great ideas about interdisciplinary work. But the project that I led on was called The Life of Breath. And just as an example of um, the kind of range of, of disciplinary expertise we had involved in this, this was us at the very start of the project um, within Durham Cathedral. And these are the different disciplines, myself, medical humanities with philosophy, literary cultural studies and history, medical history, medical anthropology, respiratory neuroscientist and a clinician, patient representation, primary care researcher, a design and workflow expert for a while, and our expert facilitator. And you'll see here, we're all standing in, um, in, the, in Durham University, and you'll see that the the gentleman on the right, who's Gareth uh, Williams from, um, from Bristol, is carrying a flute, you maybe just see. And that was because Mary here um, asked us all at the first meeting to bring along something that um, signaled our interest in the theme of breath and breathlessness. Um, and you'll see on the top left hand side there, Gareth playing his flute. Now, the reason he brought his flute was because as a child, he suffered from asthma and his parents encouraged him to learn the flute in order to help with his breath. And in the middle there, um, you'll see a, a sort of vague picture of my son, who was a lot younger at the time, and he breathed on a mirror. And I was just interested in how the breath on the mirror faded almost the minute you um, breathed on it. And I was very interested in how breath was very difficult to capture. You couldn't get hold of it. Um, and that was an interesting theme in our project. 
On the right hand, you see David, who was our kind of design person, who was very interested in the kind of creative flows around the project. Um, down below David, there's a picture of the white matter of the brain, so that signaled the interest of the neuroscientists. In the middle there is a tobacco plant. It's actually a picture of a tobacco plant in our in our garden, because um, my um, my husband Andrew Russell, who's obviously somebody that many of you will know, um, wrote a book on tobacco and decided that it would be a good idea to grow some, so he got a sense of what it actually looked like in the flesh, as it were. Um, and on the left hand side there is uh, an oxygen cylinder, a portable oxygen cylinder, because my co-PI from Bristol, Javi Carroll, suffers from a respiratory condition and needs to carry the cylinder with her everywhere she goes in order to walk. So this was how we kind of got going, um, thinking about the project, discussing these um, artifacts that signaled something about our interest in the project at the outset. And just to introduce you to, um, uh, one of the projects, just to kind of give you a sense of this kind of the work that we did that was engaging um, with others, we um, we did a project uh, on dance with our local Breathe Easy group in Darlington. As an adjunct to pulmonary rehabilitation, now pulmonary rehabilitation is the major um, management tool for people with breathless conditions, particularly COPD. Many of these conditions, as I referred to earlier, are chronic health conditions. They're not curable, but they're kind of able to be managed. And one of the problems with, with pulmonary rehabilitation is that people found it difficult to do. It was carried out, it tends to be carried out within a gym-like space, which was cult culturally not terribly familiar or um, pleasant for our colleagues. And the because breathlessness is not a pleasant thing for them to experience, they found it difficult to you know, work on a, on a single basis, just as a one-to-one -one within a gym space. So we proposed that dance might be something because it was a group-like activity. It was fun, there was music, um, and it engaged their entire body. So we collaborated with Darlington Breathe Easy and the Life of, the Life of Breath project here. And we set up um, a, a project that ran for 10 weeks where they did uh, dance classes with the dance teacher. And there's lots more I could say about it. But what I wanted to draw out of here was this issue of collaborating with so-called experts by experience. And this, our dance teacher is just standing here behind the lady in, in, in pink on her uh, right shoulder, um, Sean Williams, who did a fantastic job with them, but in a particular kind of way. So these were the kinds of things that we found when we um, we went in, and you know I, I feel slightly embarrassed to say this. We went and, and introduced ourselves to the group, and we said, um, "Would you like to be involved in this project?" Um, and they said, "Yes, but it needs to be on our terms." Um, and so things like, for example, the timing of the classes, the fact that they had already um, uh, supported existing exercise classes. And paid for a for a, for somebody to to um, work with them who started to understand the conditions they had, um, and they wanted continuity out of that. So our proposal that we would bring in this dance teacher Shan from from London, um, they said no, we don't want that. We want our own teacher, and you can train her. So we did that. We helped to invest in the training of this exercise teacher. So we, we did that and it, it worked out very well, but various things didn't work out that well, which were, and I think one of those was um, that um, I was hoping very much to look at a shift in interoceptive awareness through the creative power of dance with people in this condition. And because we didn't have a proper dance teacher we had a kind of exercise therapist working with them. I wasn't really able to look at that. I wasn't really able to ask that question. So there are challenges, but you know, in, in, sh in kind of sharing or giving over power to your experts by experience. But I think in the end of the day, it's clearly you know, not only the right thing to do, but it has its own power. So some of the challenges of interdisciplinary work, I think coming up here, um, there, there, there is this sort of 
cultural gulf, I think, the literacy you need to have of each other's um, disciplines in order to work together. And I think that's solved through time and good relationships and good communication. You need to be aware of the power of the critical disciplines. This is an interesting point in our discussions in Life of Breath. We had, um, uh, on the one hand, people working in medical anthropology, um, philosophy, literary studies, to, brought a kind of critical viewpoint to the question of, of understanding breathlessness. And that often felt was, was quite sort of challenging for our clinicians who really were um, a, a kind of accepting of the kinds of ways in which they worked and, were, and found the kind of critique of that quite challenging. And on the other side of that coin, you have to be aware also of the power of, of expert knowledge. So very often we found in some, depending on what was the subject of our discussion in our, in our um, research meetings, that the um, clinicians would come in and say, this is the way it is, and here's all the background uh, research that's gone into this, and this is what we do, and this is its value. And sometimes that would sort of take over because it was so um, convincing um, and seemed so important and people were so committed to it. So there's that kind of, that balance between the, the power of the critical disciplines and the power of the expert, which can sometimes unbalance the meeting depending on how you do it. And this problem of balancing the complex reality against the need for experimental simplicity, if you're trying to create a, 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 an experiment, some kind of hypothesis that you want to test through your, 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 um, your work. I mean, the arts and humanities and social science disciplines have this ability to carry, to hold a number of competing potential responses or ideas about something in our hands at the same time. Whereas within science, there needs to be a single question being asked and tested, and that can be challenging too. And I think the practical, I mean, you're well aware of these things, the institutional structures, we work on a disciplinary basis. Publication is difficult. Um, interdisciplinary publication, I can answer any questions on that. The importance of space and time and the commitment to engagement with experts by experience can be difficult in health related work we all know about the challenges of ethics in relation to that. So this is just an image of some of the, the I think the important elements that come out of this interdisciplinary work, um, development opportunities, creative work, um, you know, training and consultation, engagement, strategic partnerships are all great fun. So just some of that, I think, what, what will come out of that, I think, for you is, this, is the sense that the, one of the important things to make interdisciplinary work, interdisciplinary work work is to create a culture that nurtures and supports this. So um, uh, I think um, these are the kinds of challenges and opportunities, I think, for people um, at early career researcher stage. Um, as I've already mentioned, disciplinary career structures, um, but also the, the benefits of engagement um, and the kinds of skills that might be learned through get, engaging with a complex project um, that are important. And all of this, I think, relates to the culture development. And sorry, Amanda, I'm going on rather long, but I'll just quickly skim through um, this on how we are looking at developing culture um, across Durham right now. And you'll be aware of the kinds of problems that we've got. I've talked about time already. There's a problem of diversity in career path and in community, the focus on metrics to measure success. This poor, poor support um, for the kind of curiosity -driv driven research that I've talked about and competition, which can be problematic. And all of these things are not really characteristics of interdisciplinary research I've talked about. There's a real context across the piece. I can say more about this. All of our funders, um, uh, um, organizations across government, um, all the, a lot of higher education institutions are really pushing to make a change in this. And the kinds of problems that we've had within uh, research um, it, because of problems with, with, um, with research, poor research cultures are 
poor quality superficiality of outputs, interdisciplinary work particularly not being supported, I think, because it's not seen to be producing the kinds of results quickly that people want, and conservatism, I think. And in my view, a lot of this is to do with a focus particularly on outcomes. You know, what, what, do we, what, what do we get at the end of the research process rather than actually the quality of the process itself? And I think what I've talked to you about in relation to interdisciplinary work is you've seen there's a big focus on creating a quality environment, the importance of relationships, the importance of sharing methodologies and knowledge, the importance of working with others outside the academic context. And that is all time consuming, but creating that vibrant kind of relationship across a project is the kind of thing that gives rise to really positive outcomes. And I see culture as a kind of organic process. This is what Terry Eagleton says in his book about culture that he wrote in 2000. It's a process going back to its original origins of the word culture. It's the tending of natural growth. And I think we're extraordinarily fortunate at Durham to have a, a really vibrant, tremendously bright, energetic set of researchers. And it's our job, I think, to, to create the kind of um, nurturing ground where people can thrive and do their best work. And we have a number of challenges. I think one of them is, is avoiding compliance with policy. Um, it's really important that it's focus on process, avoiding silos. And I think for many of you, you may be aware that, that trust is a really important one in the university. The belief that things can change in an environment that's extremely challenging. So I've produced a, a, a draft vision, which, which um, I'm kind of consulting on at the moment, that we're committed to the cultivation of research culture that's characterized by respect and care, where diversity of person, career track and role are valued and interdisciplinarity is cherished. And we want to carry out our research in an atmosphere of creativity, excitement and fun, where individuals and teams are dedicated to and enabled to do their best work. So those are the kinds of commitments we have. I'll skim through this a little bit um, because these are the kinds of actions that I think we will be starting off with. The importance of creating a joined up approach paying attention to language. I think one of the things that's problematic often for us is some of the dismissive language we use. For example, when people move on to take on a, a job outside of academia, we talk about non-academic careers, which is very damning and feels like a, a failure. Whereas we should be celebrating this sense of people achieving things beyond academia. It's such a great thing for the university. And we've held the first of our research values, uh, culture values workshop, because I wanted everyone to have a say in what they felt they valued. And you'll see here, interdisciplinarity came out in the, the word that we produced from this, collaborative, inclusive, diverse, enabling, supporting, respectful, um, safe, people belong, people are encouraged to do interdisciplinarity, people are uh, vibrant, and I think one of the things that was super when we asked the question, um, what, how does a positive research culture make you feel um, motivated, value, happy, ambitious, challenged, supported, but somebody said running downhill, actually feeling supported to do the work we're trying to do. Now, um, I think probably in order to enable questions, it's probably good that I, that I, that I finish there. Um, uh, but with just perhaps with this sense that um, there is a move towards um, support. This is the um, government's R&D people and cultural strategy um, that drives our big funder UKRI. And they're saying we need to broaden careers paths to become more dynamic, varied and sustainable. We need to support interdisciplinary approaches and we need to help researchers to acquire skills and knowledge beyond their own discipline. So. I think the move, the mood music and the funding music is behind this kind of approach. It's really important for us to try to produce a culture that's supportive of it. And I think I've outlined to you, I hope, some of the characteristics of that culture that make it really important. Um, 
So I think that's enough for me. I've probably said quite enough, but I'll, I'll stop sharing now and um, give us a bit of time for questions if, if anyone would like to have them.